The Bible says that when a man teaches the kingdom of God, it's like a, a man who goes into a house and brings out old things and new things. Because if you lost something for a long time, and then you finally found it, you think it's new again. We lost this. So what I decided to do today, and I prayed about this last night for the longest, I said, God, what do you want me to do? He says, I want you to reassure everyone this morning about the kingdom. So I want you to write down a lot of scripture right now and then go and do your own studies. The priority of Jesus Christ is the kingdom. Jesus never preached born again. I told you you have problems. Jesus mentioned born again once. And he never spoke it to a crowd of people. Take a deep breath. Good. He only spoke that word to one man, 2 a.m. in the morning. And the man was a religious leader. The man's question was important. How do I enter the kingdom? We keep preaching what Jesus never preached. His priority was Matthew 6 verse 33. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything you need will be added to you seek ye first the kingdom of God now I'm glad we have pastors here because pastors this is going to be the class that you didn't have in college this is going to be the class that you didn't have in Bible school this will be the class you didn't have in seminary I got a degree in theology and there was not one class on the kingdom and Jesus said we must seek that first so I have a degree in theology and don't know the message I wanted to mention this comment here about prototype timing now listen carefully according to chronology in the Bible Adam is about 7,000 years old, according to the chronology in the Bible. Now the earth may be much older than that, we don't know. It, it, it could be a, a billion years, million, whatever they want to talk about, six million, whatever they want to say. We don't know that. But based on the biblical chronology, mankind is about 7,000 years old. So when Adam disobeyed God in the third chapter of Genesis, God made a promise in the same chapter. He says that the woman shall have a seed that shall come into the world and shall crush the head of the authority of Satan and then shall restore man back. Well, here's a question I had about God or with God for years. God, why did you take so long to send the seed? Between Adam and Jesus is 4,000 years. That's a long wait. And I kept asking God, why didn't you send Jesus in chapter 4? Solve the problem. <laughs> That's a logical question, isn't it? Or why didn't you send Jesus during the time of Abraham, or the time of Moses, or the time of you know, the Chaldeans, or the Assyrians? Why didn't you send Moses during the time of Belshazzar, or send Moses during the time of Jesus? Why didn't you send Jesus, sorry, uh, during the time of David? Why didn't you send your, your son during the time of Nebuchadnezzar? Or, come on, Jesus, just come. And God said to me an amazing thing. He said, I sent my son, and this is his answer, in the fullness of time. Now the word fullness here 
has nothing to do with a watch you know on your hand a time of day or something the word fullness of time means everything was in its right place the setting was perfect God will always move when he has everything in the right place so why did God wait 4,000 years before he sent the Messiah because it took 4,000 years for there to be a prototype in the earth that was the correct prototype of the kingdom of God now listen carefully because it's going to help you to understand God's timing in sending the king the Messiah anointed king you have to understand his concept of a kingdom and there was no kingdom on earth that had all the components in it until the Romans arrived the Romans actually set up a prototype of a kingdom that was the closest to God's kingdom and that's why he came at that time now let me make a statement please buy this CD and think about it listen to it a few times here's a statement effective communication depends on correct concepts so when you're going to communicate with someone you got to make sure that their concepts are the same as yours otherwise there will be a misconception so every time you use words the meanings got to be the same in both persons minds are you with me so when God is about to speak into the world he has to make sure that the words that are going to be used by him are common in the environment so the Roman Empire had all the words all the concepts that a kingdom that God desired on earth had let me give an example every kingdom before the Romans all of them you, you can study them whenever a kingdom took over territory or invaded foreign territory here's what they did they would kill all the strong soldiers they would take the women and then take all the the young men and they would uproot them out of the country that they invaded and take them back to their country and make them slaves you know that all true scriptures that's what they did they would displace people the Romans were the first kingdom in history that reversed that the Romans was the first kingdom and that's why they were so successful they were the most powerful kingdom in history they were the longest reigning kingdom in history even today no one has ever passed the Romans in rulership and thirdly the Romans had the largest kingdom in history and still do they reigned from Africa to Scotland they controlled the world for 200 years they were the most powerful most successful kingdom in history why because they used God's system what is God's system the Romans were the first ones to invent God's old idea of colonization what did the Romans do whenever they invaded a foreign territory they didn't uproot the people they would leave the people in the land but the king Caesar which means you know the, it's the word for Lord he would send from his courts a person that he handpicked to that territory where he just invaded and that person would be called a tetra or a governor Pilate was one of them there are many of them and they would live in the new territory with the people that they conquered and the job of that governor was to convert that territory into Rome in other words the Romans didn't bring the people to Rome to make them Romans they took Rome to the people to make the people Rome please listen to me please so the concept when God saw it God said that's it let's go now because everything you're gonna say will make sense to them and that's why the Romans were so successful they used God's system and so came the saying when in Rome 
you do as the Romans do. In other words, wherever the Romans invaded became little Rome. They made you speak Latin. They made you eat Roman food. They made you wear Roman clothing. They made you pay Roman taxes. They made you eat Roman culture. In other words, everything became Rome. So wherever you are, it's Rome. And Jesus came in the midst of that. He was born in a colony. Palestine was a colony. Judea, that whole area, was a colony. And the governor was sent there to control it and make it Rome was Pilate. Are you following me? Words like colonia is a Greek word that the Romans implemented. Words like Caesar or Lord, kurios, were words that the Greek used for their political discussion, but the Romans implemented it. Caesar means Lord. Lord means owner. I own the empire. That's why Jesus Christ was a problem to the Roman Empire. Because he declared that he was Lord. It was a political issue, not a religious one. Jesus Christ never claimed that he was a priest. I know you're shocked, but read the four Gospels. But he claimed he was what? A king. He said, you call me Lord, but don't do what I say. Why? If I'm your owner, you don't do what Caesar, you do what I say. And then he says, if Caesar's your Lord, then you pay Caesar money. If I'm your Lord, you pay me money. It was a, real, it was a political conflict. It was two kingdoms clashing. Everybody still with me? So Jesus' message had to be a kingdom message. Okay, so let me help you out so that you will settle this forever. So when I leave the country, you will not walk around saying, I didn't understand what he preached. Okay, let's read from your own Bible. Ready, go. Matthew 3, verse 1. Read. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea. What did he preach? Repent. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is near. John's message was the kingdom message. He didn't preach baptism. He wasn't a Baptist. He baptized, but he wasn't a Baptist. He preached the kingdom. And he baptized Jesus. I wish I had time to talk about that, but I don't want to talk about it right now. But the word baptism actually implies submission to a master teacher and his philosophy. That's what baptism was about. It was really not about the ritual of the water. It was who you submitted to. Everybody had baptisms. The Pharisees baptized. The Sadducees had baptisms. Herodians had baptisms. Baptism means you submitted to a master teacher. You, you, you went under his authority and became one with his philosophy. Plato had disciples. They call him students. Aristotle baptized. He had students that followed him. <laughs> Socrates was a master teacher with students, disciples. So everyone had them. And Jesus came and he saw John. And John was the, the master teacher of his era. And John was preaching what message? The kingdom. And when Christ saw him, Jesus said, I'm going under that teacher. And so he knelt down. And John said, no, no, no. He said, shut up and let's just do this. I got to get under this philosophy because this is my message. And so the teacher became just like the student and vice versa. Let's read it. Matthew 4, 17. Read. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach. What did he preach? Repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Matthew 4, 23. Read. And Jesus went, come on, read it loud. And Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. That's what he preached. Come on, keep reading. Matthew 5, verse 3. Read. Blessed are those who are spiritually poor, for to them they can only be satisfied by the kingdom of heaven. He was talking to six billion people. He says, every human that is spiritually bankrupt, the only thing that can satisfy your emptiness is not a religion, but the kingdom of heaven. And this is why people in your country are atheists. They are agnostics. They are animists. They, 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 
they, they, they don't want religion. They're looking for something else. Religion does not satisfy your spiritual hunger. Look at that verse. He said, if you are spiritually poor, the only thing that can satisfy you is the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because that is what you lost. You didn't lose a religion, you lost the kingdom. Look at this, Matthew 6, 6, read out loud. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. Luke 4, 43, read. But he said to them, I must preach what? The good news of the kingdom to other towns also because that, because, because, because that is why I was sent. Some of these verses you never saw before. Read this one, Matthew 13, 11, read. But he replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Matthew 13, 24, read. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Look at this, Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, read. But if I drive out demons by the spirit of God, then what? Then the kingdom of God has arrived on earth. Let me tell you what miracles are. Miracles are not religious activities. Miracles are evidence of another government. Look at that verse. He said, if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, he didn't say a religion has arrived. A kingdom has arrived. How about this one? Verse 29, read. Or again, he says, can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first what ties up the strong man then he can rob his house he says i was able to cast this demon out of this man because the kingdom that was controlling him clashed with a greater kingdom hallelujah come on let's read the bible luke 9 11 read but when the multitudes knew it, they followed him and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. By the way, he didn't speak to them of Calvary. Please don't, please don't attack me yet. Read the four gospels yourself. Jesus never preached Calvary to the people. He only spoke of his death privately to the disciples. Publicly, he preached the kingdom. I'm going to get in trouble right here, but study for yourself. Calvary is not the gospel. <laughs> oh boy, I know. Oh boy, here we go. Go ahead and throw the rocks, get it over with. <laughs> and then go read the Bible. He preached to the people. Matter of fact, let's move on because some of you still ain't got it yet. Luke 12, verse 33, read. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. God's pleasure is to give you the kingdom, not to give you a religion. Oh, you ain't had enough. Okay, let's move on again. Luke chapter 16, verse 16, read. The law and the prophets, watch this, were preached up until, up until... John read on but since John we should be preaching he says the kingdom and I graduated from seminary and there wasn't a class on it the law represents Moses the prophets represent all the minor and major prophets of the Old Testament. He says, he says, the message is not what they said was coming. The message is what's already arrived. Take a deep breath. You never saw that verse before. Since John, the message should be the kingdom. By the way, it gets worse. Let's just read this one. <laughs> Matthew 23, 14, read. Woe to you theologians, you seminary graduates. <laughs> Come on, let's read it. Woe to you religious professors, you law givers, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. Watch this. You shut the kingdom of heaven up in men's faces. You won't teach it. And you yourselves would not enter, nor will you let the people who want to find it, find it. Whew. 
In other words, we are bent on teaching our own messages. Most of the theology that the world of Christendom is filled with, God knows nothing about. Hey boy, say, influence me, Lord. Say it again, influence me, Lord. In other words, you want God to influence you in this conference. I know how you feel right now, but read that. Don't look at me. Blame him. <laughs> Religious people don't want you to know this message. So they shut it up. I tell you, four years in a university in theological seminary and no class on it. How can I go through four years of study in theology about God and the Bible and have no session on the kingdom and it's the only message he said to preach? Because they shut it up. I spent one semester studying St. Augustine, who was a Catholic priest. I had to read books by Brom, the German theologian, all the deep guys, and none of them talked about the kingdom. This church should be known as the kingdom church, the place where you go to get that message. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, my assignment is a very difficult assignment because the things I do, like I'm doing right now, is very difficult. Because I've got to deal, first of all, with the church. And pastors will kill you. <laughs> Listen to me. Jesus never had a single opposition nor a problem with sinners. His greatest opposition was religious people. He says you lock it up and you wouldn't go in either. Ah, it gets worse. Let's read. Matthew 24 verse 13 read and this gospel come on say it with me and this what gospel this one this means I know there are many others that you are preaching now read again but this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into the whole world as a testimony to every Hindu, Buddhist, Shintoist, Islamic person, every atheist. He said, preach that. don't preach Christianity, preach the kingdom to them. Why? That's what they're hungry for. That's why they shut down on you. They don't want a religion. They got one already. And it ain't working. He says, when you preach that, come on, read, it, read the last line. Then the end will come. He placed the end of the world, not in the hands of God. He left it in your hands. In other words, the end of the world is dependent on a message. So could it be that the church is holding him back because we're preaching our own stuff? Please, I'm sorry. Don't look at me like that. Read. Please, I beg you. Please. No, I, I love you, you know, and this is hard work, man. Take a deep breath. Now read it again. Everybody read. Go. And this gospel of the kingdom, come on, shall be preached into the whole world as a testimony to all men, and then the end will come. In other words, he says the end is depending on what you preach. And he told us what to preach. So stop prophesying telling the people that the end of the world is coming soon. You holding it back. Not you, the one behind you, sorry, the one behind you. Are you with me? 
Are you reading the Bible? Yeah. Do you know? Let me let, let me prove it to you. Another time, by the way, this this particular statement is a result of a question they asked in verse one and two. They said to Jesus, "When is the end of the world coming?" And this was his answer. When you guys preach this message, and to every city, every nation in the world, then I'll come. But one time they asked him again. They said, "When is the end of the world coming?" His answer was strange. He said, "The end of the world." will be like the days of Noah. He says, you remember the days of Noah? The people were raveling and, you know, sinning and everything. He says, the Lord spoke to Noah and told Noah to build this ark. Watch him now. He says, and when the ark was finished, look at my lips, please. When the ark was finished, the door was closed. When the ark was finished, then the rain came, he said. And the floods rose. So shall it be in the end of the age. Now, look at me, because it might be a little confusing for you. Okay, here's what he meant. He was telling the people, telling the disciples, said, look, the end of the world at that time, the flood, didn't depend on God. It was waiting on Noah. The rain could have come if Noah was finished in a week. If he was finished in a month, if he was finished in two years, the rain. In other words, the rain was waiting on Noah. So shall the end be. God's waiting on you to do that. I am not too concerned about missionaries anymore. I'm not excited about missionaries anymore. I mean, we have a missions program. We do work all over the world. But the question I have is, what is your missionary preaching? Read the statement. You might be financing the retardation of his return. <laughs> you got a Bible school here? Thank God. You got a ministry school here? Thank God. Make sure that that school is teaching those people what message to preach when they leave here. When your denominations and your church tradition becomes more important than his instructions, then you have no reason for existence. Take a deep breath. Okay, you're going to need this one. Here we go. Matthew 16, 19. Read. Come on, go. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew 16, 27, read. I tell you the truth. Some of you who are standing here today, 2,000 years ago, will not taste death before they see with their own eyes the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That verse is never taught by theologians. Why? Because they don't want to accept that it's already here. Okay, take a deep breath. Let me explain the verse. Look at the verse. He was talking to people in a village standing with him 2,000 years ago. He says, you will not die. You're going to be alive when the kingdom comes. He went to the cross, rose again, came back, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, the kingdom is here. The kingdom of God is love, joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. The government is here now clap if you don't believe it still clap we keep putting the kingdom in the future the governor is already here don't miss tonight it's gonna be good tonight Ooh, it's gonna be so good don't miss tonight please I beg you if you miss tonight you're gonna miss how it works in Australia the kingdom is supposed to be working every day in Australia it's here on earth now I put it to you. Write this down. You can never appropriate what you postpone. Write this down. You can never appropriate what you postpone. You can never appropriate what you postpone. If you keep putting the kingdom in the future, you can never experience it now. And he wants you to experience it now. He wants to meet all your needs now. He wants you to be protected by his army now. And by the way, in an army, you know, in a kingdom, <laughs> the army is 
Let me put it another way. In a kingdom, the citizens don't fight. This is very important. Please read my book over there on the kingdom. Very important. And how God talks about this. Uh, in a kingdom, the army fights, not the citizens. <laughs> and so when you study the Bible carefully, you'll find that the army in a kingdom, in the kingdom of God, is the angels. You are citizens. So while you're drinking Kool-Aid and sipping your iced coffee with your chocolate donut, the angels are fighting on your behalf. Come on, give them a praise. <laughs> he said, I will give my angels, army, charge, that means responsibility, concerning you to protect you in all your ways. Therefore, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The next verse says, and the angel of the Lord went forth and destroyed Pharaoh's army. Let me tell you something. While you are here, there are secret agents around your house walking around right now. Big guys, man. They're walking around. That's why your car is safe. Your kids are safe. Your home is safe. Your business is safe. Why? In a kingdom, the government sends its army to protect your property. Oh, I'm going to shout all by myself. And these military guys are so awesome that the Bible says one of them destroyed Pharaoh's army. One! No wonder why Pilate became nervous <laughs> when he threatened Jesus. <laughs> oh, I gotta go. Anyhow, there's so much to tell you. Okay, let me give you an example of how powerful the army is. Jesus is a king not a religious man that's why when they, when they arrested him in the garden he was arrested by the the religious gods they took him to Caiaphas's house and put him on trial in the court in the night which was illegal but it was a religious court the Sanhedrin council Jesus never answered them why wrong courtroom you can't try a political leader in a religious court so we just kept quiet why unnecessary to talk to these guys the wrong courtroom <laughs> they got a religion I got a kingdom wrong courtroom now watch this the Bible says then Caiaphas commanded he be sent to Pilate he went to Pilate now it's the right courtroom we got kingdom against kingdom he began to talk Jesus said, Pilate, Pilate said, Jesus, the people said that you claim to be a king. Jesus, they rightly said, for this cause was I born to be a king and testify of the truth. But my kingdom is not from this world. It's in it, but not from it. Pilate says, do you know who I am? I represent the king Caesar. I got power in my thumb. I could take your life or give it to you. Now, never threaten Jesus. <laughs> Watch his response. Jesus says, excuse me, Pilate. <laughs> Listen to his words now. He says, Pilate, you could have no power over me except it was given to you by my government from above. <laughs> that is in your Bible. The next statement, he says, because even now, watch him now, I could call 10 legions of angels, not believers. I don't need no believer to defend me. I got an army in my country. Come on, give him a praise. I will call 10 legions of angels. And they can deliver me out of your hands right now, you Roman pilot. He said, but I came to die, so shut him out and kill me good. Come on, give him a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Do you know that a legion is 6,000 soldiers? 10 legions is 60,000. Only one destroyed Pharaoh's army. 
Come on, give him a praise. Your house is safe. Your car is safe. Your business is safe. Your children are safe. Come on, give him praise. He will give his angels charge. Hallelujah. Concerning you. And he will keep you. The only problem is with the angels, they work, they work for you. You have to give them instructions because you are their boss. And so he said, angels are ministering spirits sent forth to do the bidding, the instructions of those who are heirs of salvation. That's why your house was broken into, because you left home and didn't leave instructions. <laughs> Stand up on your feet. Oh, I got a lot more to say, but we got to quit. Tell your neighbor, I'm safe. Tell your neighbor, I got an army protecting me. Lift those hands up high and say, thank you, great governor.